the daily humiliation, the desperation, the rage, the scapegoating, all the ingredients of an imminent explosion were there. What followed should have come as no surprise. It could have been stopped, but nobody cared. The world simply stood by and watched. Cockroaches and butterflies, these thoughts raced through my mind as Samuel grabbed my nose with his chubby hands, a twinkle of mischief in his beautiful brown eyes. Eloge Butera was visibly proud to see his adorable toddler sitting on his mentor's lap. I was equally proud to see my former student, now a successful lawyer, with his wife Simone, a beautiful, thriving family. I had taken a liking to him from our very first encounter when he walked into my office seeking guidance for his studies. The law students at McGill University were all impressive overachievers, survivors of a highly competitive selection process. But Eloge was a different kind of survivor. He had literally cheated death. In a bewildering twist of fate, he had made it to law school because in his childhood he had been denied entry to another school, the École Technique Officielle ETO School in Kigali during the 1994 Rwandan Genocide. On December 9, 1948, the UN General Assembly adopted the Genocide Convention. In the shadow of the Holocaust, amidst solemn vows of never again, nations declared their commitment to the prevention and punishment of this odious scourge. But in the years that followed, never again became ever again. Throughout the UN era, countless millions were slaughtered while the world stood by and watched. Having worked as a UN prosecutor on the Yugoslav Tribunal at The Hague, I found myself in Rwanda in 1995, helping set up the newly established Rwanda Tribunal. There was no doubt about the imperative of punishing the genocidaire, but the shocking scenes of carnage in the streets of Kigali, the Rwandan capital, were a stark reminder that justice cannot bring back the dead. The more fundamental question in my mind was, did this need to happen in the first place? Could it have been stopped? Was genocide an inescapable historical reality, an unavoidable expression of intrinsic predatory aggression? Or was it a premeditated political choice that was foreseeable and thus preventable? And above all, if it was possible to stop genocide, was there a will to intervene by those with the means to do so? The conception of mass murder as rooted in human nature is often a convenient absolution from our shared responsibility to confront injustice. It is true that even if war has declined historically, there is still plenty of organized violence in the world. Looking at our brutish past, we may well conclude that despite some progress, we remain territorial mammals with an insatiable appetite for aggression. Indeed, humankind is unique in mastering the destruction of its own kind. The extermination of indigenous peoples in the Americas, the horrors of Belgian Congo, the Ottoman Empire's mass murder of Armenians, the Stalinist purges, the Holocaust, the Khmer Rouge, these unprecedented instances of barbarity are a stark reminder of the frequent divergence between modernity and morality. In pursuit of human rights ideals, we cannot simply wish evil away with the magic wand of noble sentiments. We must be sober about the reality of violence in the world. But the cynical view of human beings as incorrigibly murderous creatures does not, in my humble opinion, withstand scrutiny, not least when experienced from the vantage point of the trenches. In fact, Beyond distant philosophical speculation, a more intimate engagement with the realities of these tragic situations teaches us in unexpected ways that mindless cruelty is not necessarily the true vocation of our species. 
Let us imagine for one moment that mass murder is in fact a deliberate decision, a calculated calamity, a hateful but artificial construction of identity.